Is this thing on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Let's, let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> uh, welcome to the Cisco sponsored track sessions. Uh, this is our third session out of four today. Um, we're going to be talking about deploying and operating an NFV cloud. We've got a couple of great presenters, Naren Narendra. Naren Narendra and Juan Ramon Acosta are going to come up and give their presentation. Uh, Juan is one of our principal architects. Uh, Naren, senior product manager, uh, been working with both of them for a while. Uh, you're in for a great presentation. Um, just to save you all the trouble of snapping pictures of the screens during the presentations, all of these slides are going to be up on SlideShare within probably 48 hours. You can all, if you can go right now. Uh, so there's a general Cisco account on SlideShare where you can go get all of our stuff, but the slides from all of our sponsor track sessions uh, will be up uh, certainly before the weekend, so you can save yourself a lot of space in your photo library. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to remind you of is on your way out today, we're going to sort of funnel you all out that way, stage right. Don't forget to grab your Cisco runs on OpenStack running socks. This, uh, see, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, without any further ado, Naren and Juan and deploying and operating an NFE cloud. All right, thank you, Gary. And we will find some time. We will have some time for Q&A at the end. Good morning, folks. Uh, hope you're all doing well. So about that good morning from Gary if you did not notice about how insistent he can be. You can, you can just look at that slide there. You know, do you see anything about that little guy on the left-hand side there with the glasses on? How does he look like? You know, just look at Gary one more time. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, so I hope you guys are all having a great summit here. Uh, glad to be here, glad to be talking to you. Uh, we have a, a combination of a presentation today for you in terms of not just deploying a cloud and managing and operating it, as well as deploying NFV applications, NFV stacks on top of it so that you have an end-to-end solution that runs on OpenStack, lives on OpenStack, breathes on OpenStack. Um, so one's gonna be my uh, partner in crime to talk about the second part of it. So let's get going. So, there's a big major transformation going on on the service provider uh, space. You know, it's primarily driven by open source. That's why we're all here. Um, lots of different types of open source projects, as well as uh, NFV in terms of virtualizing the network functions um, and SDN. And each of these are not uh, something by themselves. They have a whole bunch of ripples um, in their own um, accord in terms of, you know, NFV is not just about virtualizing anybody's network function, it's all about be, being standardized, interoperable, interworkable, and all of that. So with all these three forces coming together, you know, it's basically driving the overall uh, transformation for SPs in terms of, um, you know, you name it, and that application is being disrupted today in the way that it can be managed, deployed, operated, as well as used for business outcomes. So mobility, managed services, video security, general purpose v VNF workloads, DHCP, DNS, whatever you want to call, all of them are moving on into this uh, transformation. One key uh, aspect about this transformation is while all of this is happening at multiple different levels, multiple different uh, areas, on the infrastructure side, there's uh, a couple of thoughts. One is, you know, infrastructure needs to be kind of completely glued to some of these applications. However, at the same time, such infrastructure needs to be available in a general purpose manner so that I can deploy any kind of workloads providing me different business outcomes uh, on the same infrastructure. The infrastructure needs to be flexible enough to accommodate those different workloads as well as be able to accommodate the different needs and capabilities that the infrastructure needs to provide. And so, so there's a bunch of these things uh, that we're going to talk about in many different ways, but those are the demands that we are seeing, right? And why, why obviously, you know, we want to reduce network appliances, purpose-built appliances, and move towards a more generic infrastructure where things can be easily expandable, reusable, movable, uh, and even removable. Um, 
automated service creation. So one's going to take you right into it in terms of how quickly you can turn on a service uh, today compared to what it used to be before. And uh, self-service personalization, again, you know, infrastructure is one thing, but how do you do it? Do it from the application on top, right? We're going to cover these two aspects in a lot of detail in the second half of this uh, presentation. And from an infrastructure point of view, again, you know, if you're used to SP networks, SP infrastructure, one thing that you always want to have is availability, resiliency. And you know, how do you get that out of an infrastructure? You, know, you want to generalize the infrastructure, you want to virtualize everything, but can I manage my availability? Can I manage my downtime to be as minimal as zero or close to zero? And how can I achieve that? So we'll talk about some of these aspects today. Um, a little bit in terms of the approaches being taken in the market. So this is a survey from uh, Light Reading, covering about 120 service providers. Um, and you'll, you look at this slide, I mean, the key messages are, you know, your yellow boxes there, right? There's three, or essentially four different uh, types of approaches um, seen here. However, you know, you can club them into three overall. One is a do-it-yourself. 20% of those customers are looking at how can I pull all of these things together, whether it's hardware, software, orchestration, management. I'm going to pull it together. I'm going to put it all in a manner that it can be usable, operatable, etc. And there's a certain amount of percentage, about 15 or 14 percent, um, who talk about a la carte in terms of, you know, I'm going to bring a la carte uh, pieces and figure out how I uh, manage this. And there's a good 40 percent of these uh, customers out of 120 who said, I would rather prefer a pre-integrated solution. So what's pre-integrated? Pre-integrated is something that's, you know, put together hardware, software, VNF, orchestration management, um, you know, VNF management, et cetera, all together tested, validated, so that you know what you can expect out of the system, you know, what, what sort of services you can turn on, what are some of the things that you actually cannot achieve, and you've got to go for a different option, right? So that's what I would call pre-integrated, and uh, a majority of those customers are in, the, in that bucket. There's a 26% of them, uh, you know, sim sim uh, similar to one of the adoption curves that you would have typically looked at. A part of these customers are also waiting uh, to see how things unfold so that uh, you can, they can follow the leaders and uh, save, uh, you know, kind of take the safety net, if you will. So, okay, so that's what the customers are saying, but what exactly is needed for a successful NFV stack, a successful NFV outcome, right? Um, you gotta look at this from more than one dimension, obviously, right? So what are some of those key dimensions? One is obviously the virtual management or the virtual infrastructure management. So we have OpenStack, which is the most popular um, virtual infrastructure manager out there. Um, in the container space, Kubernetes obviously is gaining a lot of ground, and it's pretty hot and emerging uh, in terms of a manager. The second part is uh, the data plane itself. When we talk about networking, packet processing, packet pushing, packet management, obviously, you know, data plane is the most important thing uh, when it comes to actual customer data and customer outcomes. Um, so in this regard, you know, we have DPDK making, you know, bringing in a lot of innovation. We've had SRIOV um, to give us that wire rate-like behavior. Um, I would, you know, I chose the word behavior instead of performance because you've got to do a whole bunch of tuning at different places. As well as FIDO. If you don't know FIDO, here is FIDO. FD.IO is what it's called, but it's uh, also referred to popularly as FIDO. FIDO is... Um, Cisco's project of vector packet processing that has been open sourced. I've got a um, big community around it now. People, you know, com committing code, releasing things month on a monthly basis, um, leverages DPDK, and uh, is proven to uh, provide um, amazing performance uh, with certain workloads. So, at the high level, do need to work on data plane, faster data plane, better I/O. Uh, in this world. And in terms of configuration, management, interactions, obviously, you know, you, need, you do need to have data models and automation. Uh, IETF is uh, working on this in a, 
in a very detailed manner. You got Netcon, Fiang, a whole bunch of things in that arena. So, and then operating system is the other one. You got to run your stuff on something. That's an operating system. Um, so that's popularly Linux. Um, and then storage, Ceph is being very popular for its uh, resiliency and redundancy as well as some of the availability capabilities. Um, and Docker as an infrastructure as well is gaining uh, momentum in this space from a container uh, point of view. So that's the infrastructure. But somebody has to manage the networking components in terms of building overlays, taking off overlays, dynamically configuring networks for a service chain that's coming up. So obviously SDN, our SDN controllers are very important. Um, from a Cisco point of view, VTS, or virtual topology system, and uh, ACI, application-centric infrastructure, are two options. But however, from a generic, in a generic perspective, SDN and network integration as well as configuration management is very critical in this space. Um, there's a whole bunch of activity going on in service chaining, connectivity, how do I bring up VNFs, how do I chain them, how do I connect them, how do I take them off, yet at the same time get better performance, get the you know, visibility, get, the, get the, the flexibility that I need. So that's where IETF has been uh, helping us with a whole bunch of standardization and of course Segment routing is something new that can uh, uh, do some wonders, taking your um, networking all the way down to the top of rack or the compute node and uh, isolating uh, well, you know, flows uh, for visibility as well as better performance. And above all, end-to-end uh, you know, -end requirements in terms of standardization, you know, interoperability across vendors, across stacks, you know, mainly driven by ETSI and uh, OPNFV. So another dimension, so we looked at what are the requirements, different levels, capabilities. At the same time, when you look at what type of deployments customers want to go with, it's not one or two. It's end-to-end -end across the network in all places of the network. And if you see from here, from your left-hand side to the right-hand right side, it starts all the way from the customer edge uh, to the cloud. And if you see the footprint, the use cases, are varied from left to right here. However, the common ask is an infrastructure that can enable multiple of these things that can be easily and commonly managed across end to end and be monitored, uh, be troubleshot easily, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of examples for each one of these places. You know, These slides are gonna be available on SlideShare, so we'll leave that for your uh, nighttime reading. So overall, you know, we looked at the deployments, we looked at what are some of the key components, what's going on in the industry in terms of transformations. All in all, if we had to summarize what are the key requirements of an SP infrastructure, it boils down to these six, not only these six, but the top six, right? The very common themes that we've heard over and over. Um, so one is carrier class infrastructure. So you virtualize, you give me the flexibility, you give me uh, the expansion capabilities, et cetera, but don't take away my performance. Don't take away my availability that I'm used to, right? And that end customers are used to, in, through which SLAs are written up, SLAs have to be met, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's very critical. Use case agnostic, so we've seen this. There's many use cases, many different places, but make sure that each one of these use cases by, can be enabled by an infrastructure that can do all these things. Uh, Standards-based, modular, elastic, standards-based, obviously, so that's there is interoperability. One of the key things why we are all here is about open source and reducing the vendor lock-in, but, but enable interoperability and better capabilities for the customer, right? So obviously makes sense. Modular and elastic, be able to expand or reduce my infrastructure as well as be able to expand the business workloads that I'm running on an infrastructure very easily without tearing down systems and having a multi-hour downtime or have to install newer sets of capabilities un unrelated, uh, sort of disjointed from the existing infrastructure, et cetera. Of course, all in all on top of this, put a little circle around all your infrastructure and say it's gotta be 
managed by a single unified management system or a set of capabilities where you should be able to monitor the system proactively as well as you know configure operate etc and one of the most important things that we have learned over the last few years interacting with customers is everything is great you know it goes back to that 40% of the customers who want to have that package solution it comes to this is let's bring all of these together but at the end of the day i would like to have one single vendor as the owner for my support contact so if there's an issue there's one number i call right and that's always going to be gary right so if you don't know Gary, we will introduce him at the end of the show. Uh, all right, so multi-level security. This is another important thing that we kind of drop or ignore uh, very often is, is my infrastructure secure? When I deploy this in a service provider environment, um, is it capable of avoiding some of the attacks from in inside and outside? Uh, can I manage my passwords? Can I manage my file ownerships and a whole bunch of things? in ways that it really is a carrier class infrastructure. So how are we uh, you know, viewing the ETSI NFE framework? How are we de delivering some of these capabilities through Cisco? So here's the Etsy MANO framework, um, very familiar to you folks. What we have done here is we have divided this into two fundamental things. The bottom half is called the NFV infrastructure and the top half is called the you know, quote unquote NFV application layer. And in the infrastructure basically it's a set of compute storage network hardware uh, you know, virtualized and provided to you as virtualized capabilities of the same uh, with using uh, OpenStack as the virtual infrastructure manager. And in Cisco NFVI uh, you know, we have a VIM called a Cisco Virtualized Infrastructure Manager, um, NFEI monitoring, unified management, SDN controllers, and uh, hardware in terms of compute network and storage. Here's the uh, Cisco NFE architecture. You know, again, bottom half is the infrastructure, as we discussed. The top half is the VNF manager, uh, the network VIM as the SDN, or the SDN controller, orchestration and you know, resource management with NSO, which is TLF, and a whole bunch of VNFs, um, CSR 1000, ASAV, et cetera, that uh, one's gonna talk about to you in a minute. Another important aspect is, you know, while we do this, while we enable all these things that we discussed in the last few minutes, um, we actually do wanna do it in an open manner. So we have a trifecta of partnership with Red Hat and uh, Intel along with Cisco to drive innovation, to drive open source work in OpenStack, in container space, in many other spaces like, you know, uh, Kimo, et cetera. And also drive some of the projects, you know, looking at all the common requirements, uh, we would like to come back to the community and drive some of these projects with you so that, you know, all of us benefit uh, from those uh, deliveries. Um, use cases, let's jump to this, right? So as we talked about, it's the same common infrastructure but can deploy virtual managed services, mobile infrastructure, mobile uh, applications, as well as media and uh, generic SP workloads. So it's uh, one single infrastructure which is flexible to enable capabilities for each of these things according to what workload you want to deploy. And all of that or most of that is powered by what is called a Cisco VIM, Cisco Virtualized Infrastructure Manager. I'm gonna build this out in the interest of time. Um, you know, it's got an installer and a lifecycle manager which can uh, install your OpenStack cloud in about three to four hours consistently every time with all the configuration that you want to be enabled in the system. Um, the, con the control plane is containerized uh, and some of the Industry folks are now moving towards this or have plans to. Um, H you know, we've written a bunch of tools and we've open sourced all of these uh, for HA verification, ELCH check, uh, virtual throughput, uh, VM throughput testing, uh, as well as um, uh, others, where we've written these tools knowing the requirements from customers and then we've open sourced them so that you know, the community can uh, benefit from this as well as improve on them uh, depending on their own customer requirements. On top of that, 
We have enabled some uh, cool capabilities for logging and monitoring. Uh, of course, security is an ingrained uh, piece of work within the Cisco WIM. And it's CI-CD enabled so that um, you know, things can be uh, delivered as quickly as in less than 24 hours to a customer. Here's the list of tools. I'll uh, leave this to you for uh, perusal later. But um, essentially, each one of these addresses a specific part or a specific need in terms of how an infrastructure should be operated uh, or can be operated and proactively managed. So with respect to use cases, let's uh, uh, double click on this and uh, I'm going to request one to take over and talk about uh, virtual managed services. Thank you. Thank you, Naren. Good morning, everyone. Um, Cisco's um, multi-service uh, platform, uh, VMS, is being thought of taking in consideration some of the service provider requirements. I think uh, Narendra's slide three capture, I think, the essence of their motivation to go VNF, and that's basically agility. How fast and consistently can I deploy uh, very well-known network constructs for my customers reliably? and at the same time be able to do them elastically. That means that depending on the demands and depending on my customer requirements, I can actually do them without having to ship an army of people in based at all in software. So VMS uh, provides you with a group of prepackaged uh, standard uh, functions that we call service packages, which are standard connectivity models for an enterprise to connect to the service provider, or to provide wide area access to the entire organization. And we are doing all that orchestration and configuration using industry open standards, young models. So we're basically are taking is the configuration sets that need to be pushed into the network functions. We abstract them with the young, with young models and then we orchestrate them. The service providers also can take advantage of the platform to create their own, their own value add in different levels. One of them is if what the service packs provide to them is enough and they just need, based on a customer need, a little tweak or an, an adjustment, they can extend what the service packs uh, provide. But if they need to build a brand new service, they can actually use the VMS uh, SDK that we provide. So let's dive in a little bit more into what are the uh, managed services for service providers that we, uh, we provide. So VMS is a cloud-ready application. Being cloud-ready means is you have to take care of the operations of the service provider. In essence, you need to be able to build new services, create a catalog of offerings, and also be able to make them available to the customer. So VMS provides you to create that as an operator, as I mentioned, using the combination of service packs and the extensibility tools and also provides another control aspect of the platform as an administrator. Who has access to the system? Who are we going to be managing or defining as a tenant? And what are the resources those tenants are using? And the most important is the self-service aspect. To be cloud ready, you actually need to put all the things that are already known and systematically repeatable and that are well defined, put them on a self-service uh, portal so the customer can just make choices and deploy and start working. When you look at the VMS service portal, uh, you as a customer are going to be able to purchase new services, those services that as a service provider you put together for that customer, whether are customizations of VMS or out of the box. You also can define what are your service level agreements that you're going to actually contractually obtain from the service provider as a customer, and you're also going to get a monitoring view of how is the health of your services, giving you some, I would say, basic uh, information and telemetrics of how your service is operating. From the service provider perspective, again, for those canonical services that they deploy and they're providing service for, they have a view into how is the service performing? Is there any help that I can provide to my customer if there are any deviations from the standard behaviors? Okay, so you at one point have a one-stop shop for basically managing all the network services. But the important aspect here is 
the platform is built based on the promise of OpenStack that is resilient, that is flexible, and also can elastically deploy virtual network functions at the point of consumption or where the customer needs them. But that also brings to the table is the ability for the customer to manage their assets and their information as it's traveling by defining probably policies or different types of traffic management uh, prioritization that they need. Um, when we start looking at the site management from the customer and service provider perspective, they have the control of their services they are consuming and they don't need to worry about sending up a, a group of people to actually rack and stack and monitor. All that information is collected by the platform over the cloud, basically having a constant monitoring of the devices or the network functions that have been deployed for the customer, collecting some data and summarizing and presenting them on an easy consumable manner. The service packs or function packs that I mentioned earlier are really, as I mentioned, the well standard connectivity models that across service provider uh, service providers in the world customers are consuming. The first use case that we're presenting is Cloud VPN, which is basically provide a customer, an enterprise, the ability to connect to the wide area network, but also provide them access, secure remote access into their organization. VMS will provide the ability to select to the customer what level of security they want, whether they want to provide remote access for uh, mobile, users, but also they can define what type, of, what type of security inspection they want on the traffic that is coming in. But I think most importantly is that they actually select the ability to deploy their wide area access dynamically and they can choose what are the capabilities that that access to the one would be. The connectivity to the sites is usually IPsec in a secure manner. So all the traffic that is exiting the organization through the service chain is going to be protected end to end. Another common use case that service providers are dealing with on, on the industry is they already have a lot of MPLS network sites deployed and that is a very costly service. How would they actually bring those uh, remote offices to consume virtualized network security services into VMS, we provide what we are calling the Converge Edge, which in networking terms will be equivalent to a virtual uh, PE. So the customer does not need to actually redeploy another service chain or another virtual service. It just tells VMS, I want this endpoint to be connected and converge into my security services. The next use case that we are uh, putting forward is the concept of virtualizing the entire branch office. What that means in the past, you actually have a guy wheeling in um, a set of devices, rack and stack, firewall, remote routers and everything. So what we are now requesting is deploy the simple or smallest open stack deployment, an all-in-one or a KVM as basic as that, connected into the service provider network. And what VMS will do is provide the customer a choice of catalog. How do you want your branch to look like? And based on that selection, VMS will basically push the flavors and the images to the remote hypervisor, configure it, stitch it, and make it available for connectivity. If the customer will require access to the wide area network, that VMS will also will be taking care of that by hooking either converging in into the security service access or creating a new IPsec tunnel into the wide area network access, okay? Here, VMS is still is living and breeding the OpenStack promise, which is elastically deploy virtual network functions at the point where the user needed, reducing the cost, the maintenance, and since uh, VMS as a plus platform is providing the monitoring and the life cycle, neither the customer and the service provider have to spend more than is necessary to life cycle and maintain those VMs. Uh, increasing dramatically their service time. Um, for example, the average time to deploy a full cloud VPN service is in the range of five to 10 minutes, depending on the location and the latency between the two endpoints. The last service that we provide on VMS is basically a 
network control plane. So basically, you are controlling and managing your wide area network from the cloud. The only thing the customer needs to do is to physically deploy a customer a device on the customer premises, point it to the service provider network, and zero touch configuration will basically allow that device to join the wide area network. It will allow it to open up connectivity either over the internet or MPLS using dynamic multi-point uh, VPN. So the customer can actually decide which path the traffic is going to navigate or go through to reach another endpoint within their corporate network going through the service provider network. The ability for the service provider to manage the I1 or the, the wide area network for a customer uh, re relies on the fact that the service is constantly monitoring what happens at the endpoints, whether they are physical or virtual. The, um, manage the management plane will constantly be collecting the information and will be able to react either to changes or anomalies that happen within the service that is being deployed. And Cisco's play for software-defined wide area network is basically embodied by the I1 use case that VMS as a function pack is providing on the solution. Uh, this slide just summarizes what are the advantages that the service provider and the customer bring to the table uh, by using VMS on top of OpenStack, thinking that OpenStack will provide all those benefits that we've been talking about. Um, just very briefly to close out on the other aspect of VMS, VMS provides you with extension points. So as we mentioned, if you need to extend the service packs, you have the ability to actually add on the value that you need in order to make a difference and make the customer happy and you as a business increase your ability to deploy new services. We provide ability to extend every single point along the workflow of provisioning a service all the way from the, the cloud service embodiment, which is what you put on your portal and your front end, to what is the configuration that is going to be pushed into the network device, all going across the platform. You can also build additional services um, if you, as a customer, have a very um, preferred customer, I'm sorry, vendor of network functions, and you don't want to use Cisco, we provide the ability for you to insert that network function into the platform and manage it. We call it opaque services because if you as a customer want to take advantage of your investment, we are just saying VMS will lifecycle and monitor you VNF, go at it, plug it in, and it's up to you as a service provider to provide all the guardrails and monitoring aspects that you need for that VNF to work. But, be, but from the VMS perspective, it still is a managed service on the cloud that will be subject to all the constraints and rules that VMS puts for managing virtual network functions on OpenStack. If you need to create a brand new service, the platform is providing you with an SDK that we actually made available on the Cisco DevNet. On Cisco DevNet, you can actually get a step-by-step -step tutorial and examples on how to build a brand new virtual managed service that you can plug in and deployed into the VMS management platform, okay? Just to summarize, the out of the box, as we have on VMS 3.0, the product grade supported uh, network functions are listed on our right-hand side. And for those that are POC, which means Cisco will not be able to provide support, are the ones uh, showed on the left side. And as I was mentioning on the previous slides, these are the BNFs that if you don't want to use Cisco uh, BNFs, these are the ones that you can actually play with on, VM on the VMS platform. Um, with this, uh, we conclude the presentation for VMS. Um, we'd like to open it for some questions. We've got about four or five minutes for questions. We've got mics on both sides, or I can bring you a handheld. If my back holds out. Okay, I'm running to you first. Thank you. Yeah, uh, there was a session yesterday afternoon when Verizon talked about a, a gap in OpenStack. Uh, they have a requirement for uh, the RBAC function, rule, rules-based access control. Um, 
do you recognize that as a, as, a, as a gap in OpenStack? Can you support it in another way? Do, do you recognize that whole issue that they raised? Uh, in all honesty, I haven't been able to attend that session. So, you know, our back um, in terms of uh, managing OpenStack or our back in terms of network functions and enabling network functions. I mean, okay. I can give you um, a, a, an answer based on the VMS framework. So VMS is actually managing the network for you um, and it's actually on a control environment. So the service provider, yes, will be exposed by that um, hold on the OpenStack, but since the environment, at least VMS, is on the management protected side of the service provider, the service provider and the service provider has control to prevent uh, unauthorized access to that, that's one side. VMS will only allow access to users defined within the authentication uh, control plane of VMS. And for accessing any resources direct to OpenStack, that is a service account that is never exposed to end users or administrators. This is something that the data center um, operations team will have under control and very certain will be under the regulations of the uh, security and trust team of the service provider. But we don't, and also we don't uh, store any clear text passwords. So we are at least on that, on that uh, front restricting uh, the access from our authentication and role access level that we define on VMS. So we, we are kind of a layer on top of OpenStack preventing that. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, you're gonna you're gonna make me work for this, aren't you? <laughs> so there is a, a Linux Foundation sponsored uh, open source project called OMAP. So basically, it's a, a telecom operator uh, uh, leading the the effort to. I think the uh, the project is cover similar things about the uh, 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 we whatever you just uh, uh, presented. So my question is uh, how the Cisco, uh, uh, what advantage or strategy uh, Cisco has to you know, pursue the, uh, those VMS and to, um, to convince the operator they will, they will not choose uh, the open source one and will choose the Cisco one. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I actually wouldn't look at it in that manner, whether it's Cisco or OpenStack, right? So this is something that VMS is something that's been built and packaged given customer demand. And if you see there's openness all around in terms of the platform as well as the VNFs and the orchestration and you name it, there is a piece of uh, open source in there that can be integrated with. Um, in terms of own app, I mean, Cisco participates in all, you know, all of these uh, open source uh, activities, right? So this, it's actually not the case of its own app or Cisco, it's actually have the collaboration uh, to build the best, essentially. Right, um, just from the technical perspective, some of the things that we do when we get feedback from the open source community is we need, we look at what is the standard or the new standard being put forward and we try to either align with them on our roadmap, but uh, we just need to keep in mind that the project started probably later than when we started VMS. This has been an evolution. So there is gonna be a point where we are gonna to have to converge technically on some aspects to take the best of both worlds. But uh, I think uh, some of the executives will be better uh, positioned to comment on what is that is gonna happen. Uh, at this point, I think this is the best offer that we can provide based on the current conditions and the current availability. We will take one more quick one because we got to clear the room for the next presenters. And I'll make it a quick follow up. You mentioned uh, that uh, you provide a lot of the layers for security, including RBAC, that the gentleman mentioned, yep. that, that OpenStack does not provide. Is this a solution that's probably going to be permanent in VMS, or do you see uh, OpenStack at some point providing that later layer and Cisco stepping back and letting OpenStack do that? So we do our own RBAC from the context of VMS. So at least we are uh, indirectly being a stopgap 
by no means we are replacing OpenStack. We are always building on top of OpenStack. If there is any new enhancement coming from OpenStack, we will take advantage of them, but we'll never try to replace them. Yes, yeah, so I just want to follow up on that, right? So from an infrastructure or OpenStack point of view, if you look at it, um, there's a whole bunch of things that we do today in Cisco Vim in terms of the security measures, password management, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it doesn't stop right there. In fact, for example, Barbican is key store, um, uh, the key store project, right? So the PTL is from Cisco, Dave McCowan. And um, so that's a clear example of standardizing things into OpenStack. Uh, rather than creating these snowflakes outside of it, right? So it's totally unmanageable for everybody, for the vendor as well as the customer and the community. So, <laughs> all right. Yes. I think people are referring to the problem with Keystone having just as far, uh, last time I checked, four roles per tenant, like a member, admin, uh, uh, and two others. And of course, uh, uh, service provider requires other roles like, I don't know what IT administrator can do, what HR can do, and all that. So it, it's missing, but Keystone has that roadmap. I'm just That's a great pointing thing. that Thank out. you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Naren, Juan, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, don't forget. Grab your runs on OpenStack running socks out stage right. We've got another session coming up in just about 10 minutes uh, networking right. across containers and VMs. Thank you, folks. Have a great afternoon. Stay Thank back you very much. Thank and you. Stop by the Cisco booth. There are VIM and VMS demos going on at the Cisco booth. <laughs>